sweetheart. Thanks so much, uh, Srikant. It uh, is a pleasure to be here, and thank you for hosting us today. Under your leadership, Harvard Business School has done a great deal to increase its capacity to take on the sweeping implications of climate change and the energy transition for business. And to the audience assembled here and online, good morning. Welcome to the first Harvard Climate Symposium hosted by the new Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability. In this room sit some of the world's leading climate experts, leaders from business and government, advocates, organizers, academics, and students. Later today, we'll be joined by the nation's top climate negotiator. This is not a group that gets together often, and I'm delighted that you have taken the time to do so. Today's symposium is focused on the fundamental changes we must all make over this decade to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These changes will require leadership from all sectors of society, from our political system, the private sector, and civil society. Universities, too, must lead. Universities have provided the scientific insights that shape our understanding of climate change. Many of the innovations driving clean tech started in university labs. University scholars have shaped many of our environmental and climate policies and regulations. Many of our alumni, including some in this room, are leading efforts to address climate change in Massachusetts, in Washington, D.C., and around the world. We are inspired and motivated by your work. One way that universities can lead is by preparing students for a life and career shaped by climate change and its ramifications. Another is by supporting their researchers whose creativity will be critical to confronting the climate challenge. Harvard is doing all of this and more. We are taking a fresh look at climate education across all of Harvard. Through the Salata Institute, faculty are working in new disciplinary research teams on pressing climate problems. In the half year since we launched the Institute, we have funded five new teams encompassing 30 Harvard faculty from seven schools. They are already at work on some of the challenges we will discuss today. I firmly believe that the university's work must be informed by real-world stakeholder needs. For this reason, the Salata Institute's new Climate Action Accelerator is connecting our faculty experts to those who will create, test, and implement new climate solutions, and to those who will be impacted by climate change and the energy transition. Today's symposium is the first of many convenings and engagements that will be hosted by the Climate Action Accelerator. Through events and outreach, the Accelerator will become a platform for bringing together experts and stakeholders to drive solutions on pressing climate challenges. We're going to spend much of today focused on climate solutions, but first I'd like to ground the conversation. I'm an economist, and you're on a university campus, so I hope you will forgive my starting the morning with a chart. <clears throat> this chart shows current emissions of carbon dioxide from energy in the United States. <clears throat> the data are from a study released in March by the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the agency responsible for monitoring and modeling the U.S. energy sector. This chart covers just a slice of emissions. It's only CO2, not all greenhouse gases, and it's only the U.S., not global. But by focusing on U.S. CO2 emissions, we can see the complicated glass half full, glass half empty situation in which we currently find ourselves. And as the country responsible for most of the CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, the U.S. has the moral responsibility to lead in cutting emissions. U.S. CO2 emissions from energy peaked in 2007 and fell 20% since then. The dips in 2009 and 2020 were respectively the financial crisis and COVID recessions. The decline from 2010 to 2019 was largely due to switching from coal to newly inexpensive natural gas to generate electricity. Recently, wind and solar generation has helped, 
driven by price declines, state policies, and federal subsidies. Overall, only a small part of the decline of U.S. CO2 emissions to date has been driven directly by federal climate policy. The EIA also projects emissions through 2030, both under current policy, which includes the Inflation Reduction Act, the large climate bill Congress passed last summer, and counterfactually without the act. If you're in the market for a new car, you probably know about the act's electric vehicle tax credits, which are worth up to $7,500 per vehicle. Among other things, the act also extended tax credits for wind, solar, and other zero carbon energy sources. As you can see, the EIA projects that without the Inflation Reduction Act, emissions would continue to decline, but slowly. The act accelerates this decline, reducing 2030 emissions to 33% below 20, 2005 levels. This is conservative relative to some other studies, which project 2030 emissions to be about 40% below 2005 once the act is included. Even so, that 40% cut is well above the target of 50% announced ahead of the Glasgow COP26 meetings in 2021. So does the EIA have a rosier projection beyond 2030? Unfortunately, no. The EIA projects U.S. emissions under current policy to remain high. If the rest of the world does as we do, then global temperatures will rise well above 2 degrees by the end of the century. U.S. Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, will discuss the importance of U.S. leadership with us later today. The consequences of this projected path would be dire. In, the country, in this country and globally, it's the most vulnerable who will suffer the most, low-income communities and people of color. Indeed, the climate impacts already being felt so keenly in the global south motivate two of the Salada Institute faculty research teams, which are partnering with local scholars, communities, and NGOs to study how, how to enhance resilience to climate change impacts in South Asia and West Africa. To me, this chart captures our moment with its mixture of climate optimism and deep foreboding. The optimism is well-founded. Let me point to four big trends. First, the public conversation around climate has moved beyond whether climate, is hap climate change is happening or whether it is man-made. To be sure, there are holes in our knowledge, and one of the breakout sessions this afternoon will discuss the current state of our climate science. But the debate has shifted, in part because climate change is manifesting in deadly storms, droughts, and fires. Second, climate change has galvanized a global youth movement. That movement has been a drive key driving force in both public policy and public opinion. Third, the cost of producing and using clean energy has fallen dramatically. Clean tech is really taking off, and we're on the cusp of the biggest revolution in the auto industry in a century. Prices of EVs are falling fast, with some already cheaper on a life cycle basis than comparable conventional vehicles. Fourth, these tailwinds and pressures have propelled concerted policy action, both internationally and here in the United States. But as the chart showed, there's still much more to do. Under the EIA's projections, by 2030, we will have only cut emissions by one-third. Although there's a lot of uncertainty around that projection, clearly that's not good enough. So given all the progress I outlined a few minutes ago, why is this so hard? In the world of energy wonks, it's common to talk of some sectors as being hard to abate, which just means they're hard to decarbonize. An example is aviation, where we don't yet have a good alternative to, to petroleum jet fuel. I think this shorthand of hard to abate is somewhat unfortunate because it implies that other sectors are, well, not so hard. A better framing is that all sectors are hard, but each in their own way. In some sectors, like aviation, what's currently hard is the technology. In other sectors, the hard part is what you might call human systems challenges. Most of our legal, political, and cultural institutions simply are not built to accommodate, far less to drive, rapid change. 
These human systems challenges are hard because there isn't a single solution. Instead, they require attacking the problem on multiple fronts. For example, consider the electric power sector, one of the, so, one of the not so hard to abate sectors. To reduce power sector emissions, all we must do is to site vast numbers of new solar, wind, and storage facilities, connect them all to the grid, then transmit that power to cities, all while demand is expanding to electrify ground transportation and building heating. As a breakout session this afternoon will discuss, this vast project will require regulatory innovation, new approaches to community engagement, and arguably new legislative authority. Whether we can achieve the bipartisan agreement needed to build this low carbon infrastructure remains an open question. Doing so will require a process that really hears and addresses the concerns, traditions, and needs of local stakeholders. These issues get at a fundamental challenge, that climate change must become less of a political wedge issue if we are to lay the legal and regulatory foundations for decarbonization. Corporate pledges to reduce their emissions can also play a role in decarbonizing the power sector and beyond, but corporate efforts also have become entangled in this political discourse. Discord. As will be discussed in the second plenary session today, corporations have multiple stakeholders to whom they owe a variety of duties. As a result, to be truly effective, corporate emissions pledges and actions must work in tandem with stable and effective climate policy, not be a substitute for it. Other challenges extend far beyond the energy sector, including preparing for the inevitably worsening damages from climate change. Further, any policy that shifts resources away from fossil fuel communities runs the risk of leaving behind legacy pollution and job loss in its wake. The communities harmed by the current energy infrastructure must benefit from the energy transition. We cannot address climate change without addressing equity. So we are at a crossroads. There are reasons for optimism. Capital is mobilizing behind ever cheaper, low carbon technologies. Corporations see business opportunities in the energy transition. Civil society and the youth movement are keeping the pressure on for real and equitable change. But at the same time, we need to think of and implement new strategies. Those new strategies will involve all corners of society and all our leading institutions. So let me conclude by posing three high-level questions for you to consider today. First, the first question is about the role for national policy. With the Inflation Reduction Act now in place, what is the agenda for effective U.S. climate policy over the rest of this decade, and how can we, we put it in place given our political discord? Moreover, how would it inform and influence the way we engage partners around the world? The second question is about the role of business. <clears throat> the private sector will bring to market the inventions and will produce the goods and services needed to drive decarbonization. But can the private sector expand its role through voluntary commitments, such as corporate emissions targets? How do those additional commitments and investor pressure, how can they be structured to drive economy-wide decarbonization? My third question is about the role for civil society. The youth climate movement, indigenous climate activists, NGOs, and many others have been highly effective in driving action and in changing minds. What are the next steps for civil society in bringing about an equitable energy transition? Thank you, and with that, let me invite Peter Tufano to the stage. Peter is the Baker Foundation Professor at Harvard Business School and is a senior advisor to the Salata Institute. Until 21, Peter was dean at Oxford Said Business School. Peter will introduce the panelists. <clears throat> 